Thanks for tuning into today's podcast. Before we begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our new remote training here at RPP. We've been offering remote training for quite some time, but we always required the athlete to come in-house for an assessment. Now we can do the whole assessment online and bring all of our services, pitching, hitting, and strength training to your doorstep. So if you like what we do and how we do it, go to our website at rocklandpeakperformance.com and click on remote training in the toolbar. Thanks. The Behind the Seams Podcast. I'm your host, Nunzio Signore, looking to bring you great dialogue with some of the best in the world of player development. The world of training baseball players has changed dramatically during the past few years, and I'm looking forward to shedding some light here on what's the latest, what's the best, and what's really happening in the world of player development. Thanks for joining me for the ride. Hey guys, thanks for tuning into the Behind the Seams podcast. I'm super excited about my guest today. If there's a guy who's done it all on the coaching side, it's this guy. Uh, my guest today is Jerry Weinstein. Um, Jerry is a graduate of UCLA, where he received his BA and his master's in teaching credentials. He has coached at the high school level. He's coached the college level, including 23 years at Sac City, one of the preeminent JUCO baseball programs in the country. He has coached or helped coach in the Pan Am Games, as well as the 92, 96, and 2000 Olympics, where he received a silver and bronze medal with Team USA. Jerry has been with the Brewers, the Expos, the Cubs, the Dodgers, and the Rockies, and he has also managed Team Israel. The guy's written numerous articles, three books, you know, chapters for two others, and has produced various instructional videos. And unlike the rest of us who slug every day, he lives in San Luis Obispo, California, <laughs> which I'm a little jealous about. But um, I'm going to tell you today of all the podcasts I've done as of yet, I've learned a lot from all my guests. But this guy, I, I really, really am going to sit back. I'm, going, I'm just going to be a spectator with you guys today. So my guest today is Jerry Weinstein. Hey, Jerry, thanks for coming on the show. Noons, uh, good to be here. Like I told you before, I, you know, I really, I listen to all your podcasts and really enjoy them and, and uh, all your blogs and stuff. And I'm, I'm happy to be part, just a small part of it today. For me, this is a really great um, experience because like I was going to say, I, <clears throat> I've been interviewing a lot of guys and a lot of guys in this industry, the up and coming guys, we got a lot of really smart young guys, you know, and um, me being 60 years old, I, uh, you know, I, when I'm at these seminars and we're all speaking, um, I kind of feel like, like the fatherly figure until Jerry walks in a room. And I'm going to tell you, there is no substitute for time spent on earth. So <laughs> while I, while I interview all these guys and I listen to everybody talk and I listen to all that young talent, when you can get in front of somebody that's been as smart as these guys for a longer amount of time, that's where my aha moments pop in. And this is one of those times for me. And I don't think I've ever interviewed anyone with such an extensive resume as yours. So if you could, I'm going to shut up and give us a bit of an edited, and I say edited because it's so extensive, um, <laughs> version of your path up the ranks, starting from UCLA. Uh, well, graduated from UCLA in the next, and in California, you have to have a fifth year to get a teaching credential. And I had a double major and it was physical education at that time. Then we got smart and we became kinesiologists and, uh, and history. And then uh, while I was doing that, I coached the freshman team at UCLA. The coach there, Art Reichel, was nice enough to, he knew what my passion was. And then from there, I went to Santa Monica High School from, and I coached football and baseball, great school, uh, <clears throat> very diverse school, uh, economically and socio and, and uh, ethnically and in, in all areas. It was really a great, uh, foundational piece and then went to LA Valley College as an assistant uh, Sac City a year out at Sac City to uh, uh, coach at University of Miami and uh, then during the summers was able to coach uh, internationally in, in in Italy a couple times and then uh, Pan Am team a couple Olympic teams and uh, then went from uh, from Sac City to uh, the Dodgers uh, I've been the, the catching coordinator, but I've done that before in the 80s for the, the Brewers. I think I was the first 
catching coordinator in professional baseball Interesting. And, and then became the director of player development and was not very good at it, got fired, <laughs> went back to college, went to Cal Poly. I was the assistant there and, and then, uh, <clears throat> then went with the, the Rockies and, uh, uh, been there for 16 years in, in just about every capacity, catching coordinator, managed for six or seven years, was a supervisor, coached in the big leagues, and now I'm a special assistant to uh, scouting and player development, go out and see the the uh, the uh, upper level elite uh, amateur catchers and then uh, roll through the farm system in Spokane and Fresno, Hartford, and Albuquerque. And uh, other than that, um, <laughs> trying to get better. <laughs> and that's exactly what I'm talking about. You, you know, you said player development wasn't very good at it, got fired. The the ability, the ability to just come to terms with that and just speak that is something that a lot of our younger crew needs to learn how to lose their vanity a little bit, I think. And I think as we get older, we learn how to lose that vanity and it makes you a little bit more real. When I listen to you speak, when we, when we do pitch a Palooza, when we do these different seminars and you're speaking and I listen to you speak, I feel comfortable listening to you because you look and feel so comfortable when you're speaking and your ability to just lose your vanity like that and say something like that is something I think a lot of guys are, are, aren't comfortable with doing. And I think that as you get older, you, 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 you tend to, hey, hey, man, you know, there's bigger fish to fry here. Well, I, I, mean, I mean, there are some things you can control and some things you can't. And for me, every day is important and it always has been. I mean, obviously, someone who's 79 says that because they don't have that many days left. But I, I felt that way when I was 21 years old. Hey, I, you know, bad stuff happens. Let's move on. Let's and, move on. Uh, right. And it was interesting because that do, being the director of player development for the Dodgers was my dream job as a kid. Uh, in the 50s, uh, I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. Uh, Roy Campanella was my guy, and I get this job, and totally unprepared for the job. By uh, I was told, "Hey, don't worry." He says, "You handle stuff on the field, and we'll take care of the office." And the first day uh, I start the job, I get a call, some arcane uh, uh, deal on player on uh, uh, workman's comp, and I said, "I don't know." Ask so and so. He says, "Well, he said to ask you," and I said, "Wait a minute, I'll get back to you." And I called my this guy and i say what does, what's the deal here i don't know he says oh you'll learn he says i gotta spend more time with the big league club blah 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 well <laughs> anyway but yeah uh, great experience <laughs> and i mean i i i take value in in every experience i have you know uh yeah. you either get better or you get worse you never stay the same and so you know i just try and value the the moment yeah because they go quick no john, doubt. john lennon said life's what happens when you're busy making other plans and, you know, that's true. You blink and 15 years has gone by, you know. So. Yeah, it's, it's unbelievable. I mean, the old, the old guys, you know, they said, where, where, what? You, they, you look in the mirror someday and say, holy cow, how did that happen? Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, uh, and it, uh, it happens in, in a hurry. It happens in a hurry. But one thing that hasn't affected you is your, your ability to stay on top of things that are groundbreaking and things that are new and cutting edge. I love the fact that you're fearless in terms of your ad adaptation and ad adoption of all the new technology and knowledge in today's game. Many stick to what's worked for them and tend to ignore the new. Here's my question. What is it about you that makes you different and has enabled you to adopt and incorporate much of the new tech being introduced in player development rather than knock it and just keep talking about the old days. Like I hear a lot of guys do. Well, I'm, I'm a very, very competitive person. You know, someone told me, yeah, you would cheat at checkers. I said, you're right. <laughs> if I could win, you know, and, and, you know, there's a very fine line, the edge, getting the edge and, and the man with the most information wins and uh information is king and if you're afraid of information or new information and i I, th I learned early on at ucla and i think it was uh in our in our physical education or kines department uh where they were talking about uh advanced performance advances early on and you know they were talking they're, they're either technological or physiological or performance related you know it's kind of like <coughs> the transition at that time was uh, uh in performance this was during the Cold War, Eastern Bloc kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the transition from uh, uh, bamboo pole, pole vaults, pole vault, uh, pole vault poles to uh, more composite pole vault and 
instead of sawdust, they add foam. And, you know, so a lot of the performance enhancements were technological in that respect, but also at the same time in, in Europe, there were a lot of uh, strength and conditioning and performance, you know, guys were, were improving their, improving the, 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 uh, the air, the, 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 the archer himself, not just the arrow, right. uh, be, through strength and, and, and nutrition and you, you name it. And, and then also there was a, a time, especially you know, even in the United States where, you know, video analysis, especially early on in football and then early on in swimming with Doc Councilman at University of Indiana and where they were really understanding movement. And now we have more and more tools to do that. And the better you are at doing that, the more you can maximize the the performance. And, and it's just, you know, it's a small edge. Just getting a slight edge makes all the difference in the world because we're all we're all tied into the scoreboard, especially those of us that are in player development. And uh, win, win and loss in, on a particular day is is uh, is very micro. I, I I remember. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember when I was a kid, very young. I remember those those early '70s Olympics when the Eastern Bloc countries were kind of wiping us out in a lot in a, in a lot of things. And I remember back in the day they used to talk about how they put these sensors on their players and on their bar to measure bar speed. And now, lo and behold, I think maybe we're talking. 45, 50 years later, I write a book on bar speed and, and velocity-based training, and we've adopted that. And we have, you know, over the course of time, I think that those Eastern Bloc countries, um, they, they were incorporating tech. And, and, and I was only eight, nine, 10 years old. So correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember in the 70s, the, the Soviet Union and the East, Eastern, Eastern Germans, East Germans, they were they were killing it. And I, I think that they were the ones that were adopting tech first. Am I correct? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, I go back in the 60s and there was a sprinter from uh, the Soviet Human Union. I want to say his name was Valery Borzov. And he was an engineered sprinter in, in every respect from his body to his technique to his training regimen. And they really, they really understood it because they put the, the best and the brightest on that, on that, uh, that task. And they, and they got, the answers they needed at the time. And of course, even now we're better now every day. We're better, you know, to think that just cause you know, uh, <clears throat> I mean, we swim faster, we run faster, we throw farther, yep. we throw faster. Everything's better today. Well, why is it? Why is it because of the, it's not because of the, 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 the athlete themselves, it's because of all this technology. And so to ignore that and not at least become aware of it is, is ridiculous. I, I cannot ignore the fact that five years ago, I listened to Dr. Brian Mann talk about velocity-based training, maybe six years ago. And I dove into it head first because I was thinking to myself, this seems like an absolute no-brainer for, for guys to get stronger at an accelerated pace and safely, which is the most important thing. And I dove into it, and I can tell you that over the last five years, my athletes have gotten exponentially better Every year, um, as 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 more and more of them adapt using bar speeds, and um, like you said, it's it's making people better. So, are your overall thoughts on tech? It's in changing the game. One of them, it's, it's you feel like it is helping make athletes better. Correct? Without a doubt. I remember graduating from UCLA, and we had spent a lot of time talking about specificity and overload through rate, intensity, and duration. And I started. In 1968, it's at Santa Monica High School, we, we talked, you know, I was big into throwing velocity. And so uh, I made these polyurethane baseballs and we had an area where we could throw and we, and we threw weighted baseballs. And, and I didn't, we didn't have a specific protocol and we didn't measure it because we didn't have a radar gun at that time. But I know that we used weighted balls in 1968 and, and specific overload and and, and overloading through the range of motion was, was big. And the, at the time, the, the space race was going on and they had extra genies that they were using in space and yeah. uh, other devices to, to, so that those, those uh, 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 astronauts wouldn't be so atrophied by, and couldn't do their jobs in space. And so, you know, I, I was into that and video analysis. I mean, I, I've been... And as a product of being a football player and coaching football, I've always used videos, 
Super 8, and I've used it with baseball and, and, and obviously with the mocap systems. And I mean, the technology has gotten a lot more user-friendly, a lot more sophisticated, a lot more accurate, and a lot more measurable. Yeah, I think that, guys, I think that, you know, you have to be able to analyze video. You have to actually be able to stand in front of a player and see what's wrong as well. Um, I think a lot of guys that, are, that get anti-tech, I think a little bit of that stems from sometimes just being afraid of not understanding it. Because I think you need both. And, you know, that's, that's getting to be a played out statement. But nothing could be further from the truth. You know, you, you can, I, use it, I use it as a red flag. Okay, I use data as a red flag. You have to know what to do with the data or it's pointless. So I think that there's a way to use both, you know what I mean? And, and that's, that's a big thing. Well, I think a lot of people in general, not just in athletics, but in all fields, are, are not comfortable being exposed for what they don't know. And uh, uh, I, I, have you read uh, Adam Grant's Think Again? Think Again, again. Oh, yes. I mean, great, great book. I, I was mean, just, as you were saying that, I, I, I read that book last year, and I think it's great how people don't want to actually rethink their thoughts because they're afraid of being wrong. And we and we and like I tell <laughs> I tell young young players, you know, I'm dealing with 18 to 23, 24 year olds, and and I say, look at guys, let me tell you something. He says, I've been 21, but you've never been 79, and That's so. The <laughs> that's that life. That's that time is spent on earth. That's right. what I'm talking and, about. And, you know, we're going to make mistakes. It's not life is not a game of perfect. Baseball certainly is not a game of perfect. There are no always or nevers. And, um, you know, a lot of it is is, you know, it's a spray gun approach. We're just trying to find things that work for each individual. It's very individualized. Yeah. Uh, I know, uh, early on when I was getting my teaching credential and you take a teaching methods class and the guy hammered individual differences dealing with individual differences and we're comfortable with one size fits all but that's certainly never the case and and uh, we're only seeing on the surface and 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 like for me I, I talk to athletes every day about the best lessons are self-taught we're not an MRI machine I can't get inside your head I'm not you know an electrophysiologist or a psychologist and you know yourself the best, and so you've got to take control of your own destiny and figure out what's best for you and not wait for someone to drop you on the top of the mountaintop. Amen. I tell my daughter all the time, she's, she's, she's 21, and she's in her last year of college, and she's so afraid of, of making a mistake. And I'm like, you know what? I'm at the point in my life right now when I make a mistake, I feel like going to the mountaintop and yelling hallelujah because I love those moments where I prove myself wrong or something proves me wrong because that means i got a little bit smarter today and i think i think we need to embrace that you know oh, without a doubt and, and and like i tell guys all the time i said look i've been doing this thing for a long time and boy i've screwed up more people than than I've, I've helped for sure but the intent was good at the time and with the information that i had it was the right thing to do but now i know better yes and all right <laughs> let's let's talk some baseball here uh Major League Baseball hitting averages are continuing their downward path. Uh, I can only assume most of this is due to the rising velocities and some perhaps from better ball movement getting created with all the new tech. Do you see anything on the hitting side that you feel can help reverse this trend? Well, we're developing some better tools so that we can, so that we can train more specifically towards the demands and complexity of, of a very chaotic game. Uh, I think, and I guess what I'm talking about is that uh, you, the new pitching machines and, and the programmable machines that, that pretty much replicate the actual ball flight in, in the course of a game. And, uh, you know, certainly there's some variable randomness to it. It's not like, hey, every 2 and old count, this guy's going to throw you a four-seam fastball with the, this kind of induced vertical break or whatever. But I think we have better training tools, number one. Number two, I think, and we're not there yet, uh, are, it's become a power game on the mound, but it's become a, a power game in the batter's box. And we're so in love with on-base percentage because this is what the analysts are telling us, that game is driven by slug. And now our eyes tell us, well, well, say, for instance, a guy has 600 plate appearances and he hits 30 home runs. That's, that's pretty good power, right? Okay, but for every 100, 95 at-bats, he ain't hitting a home run. What are you doing the other 95 at-bats? to help your team win a game. 
And I think that we're adverse to making two strike adjustments, whether they're physical or mental. Uh, it's become an all or nothing approach and we're artificially trying to create ball flight. And uh, I think that, uh, <coughs> I think it, I think it'd be interesting and it'd be quite a seat change and, and quite a gamble for, say for a team, hey, now we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna be more athletic because more athleticism produces better defense. And defense comes to the ballpark every day, and speed comes to the ball. So it become more of a speed defense with a sprinkling of the power, but go more speed defense and put more, and especially with some of the new experimental, uh, and I'm rambling here, you asked me how to make No, it's good. How, what time it was, I'm telling you how to make the watch. But uh, in, the, uh, in the minor league, some of these experimental rules with a two-pick max, with, with the, with the uh, timer, the pitch timer, that's going to be huge. If, if either one of those get to the big leagues with the bigger bases, now the the, the Cardinals of the 80s, uh, uh, the go-go socks, those types of things, it, it, we have a very kind of a very sterile type game right now. It's just go up there and swing from your ass and, and try and lift the ball and, and you know, you swing and miss, you swing and miss, and, and maybe we'll get back to more of a athletic force the issue uh, execution. I mean, when's the last time you saw a, a true hit and run in a baseball game? Right. I mean, a true, not just some guy running and the other guy swinging the bat, where a guy's trying to create uh, yeah. a ground ball out of the middle with a guy. A chess match. Yeah, a chess match. You know, I mean, and so it's really playing defense, even though everything's happening faster now. Uh, playing defense is pretty predictable, but when things start getting a little bit more chaotic on the on the uh, offensive side with delay steals, reading more balls in the dirt, uh, going from first to third, stealing third, stealing bases. We have to change the rule because guys refuse to learn how to hit the ball the other way when guys are playing shifts or refuse to bunt the ball. Uh, you know, that, that becomes a wasted at bat, which is ridiculous. You know, that's a battle. You can see how I feel about this, but yeah, uh, we have to be we have to be willing to change our offensive philosophy, uh, and it'll make for a much more viewer friendly game, more diverse, more exciting. I think I think it's interesting that you said um, create more athleticism to to help create better defense. I think that a lot of people just associate creating better athleticism with being able to throw the ball harder, run faster or hit the ball harder. And I think that everybody tra everybody associates becoming more athletic with simply becoming more, helping your offensive maneuver, whereas they don't even take into consideration the ability to change direction quicker and how you just explained how that, how that affects gameplay and how that can trump things sometimes. I also remember, I also remember, I'm from South Philadelphia. So I remember my, uh, my growing up when I was about eight years old, there was a guy, nine years old, and I'll never forget, he was a big physical presence. presence. You're going to know this guy as soon as I say his name. His name was Richie Allen, oh, and he was, a, well. he was a monster. And I remember I used to watch the Phillies games with my dad, and Richie Allen either hit a home run or he struck out. And, and he – he like they, like like you were saying they're either hitting the ball hard or going. But I remember this guy when he would swing, uh, it looked like his all he really wanted to do was rip the cover off the ball. And I remember that I remember that leaving such an impression on me. I was like, wow, this is a, just this guy's a monster. Do you remember Richie Allen? Oh, I knew Richie Allen. He because he came to play for the Dodgers, and I had I had connections with with. Heard he was an amazingly Allen. nice guy. I, oh, you know. really, really nice guy, and. And uh, and was he was one of the strongest men ever. Uh, he was pound big. for pound. Yeah. Um, in a team <laughs> in a team setting, how do you prioritize individual development and team focus? In other words, how do you distribute time, um, individual and team? How do you? Well, uh, I, I think that if you build individual skills, that improves your team. You know, I, I remind uh, Scar Sparky Anderson. And they asked him one time, they said, uh, hey, Sparky, he says, uh, he says, what kind of team chemistry are you going to have this year? He says, oh, he says, yeah, just give me eight guys with good stats and we'll have great team chemistry. <laughs> so, I mean, if you improve the quality of the individuals on the team, the overall product is going to improve. Uh, so, if they're, if, if they're, their goal is 
the scoreboard and helping their team win uh, uh, on a nightly basis. But you have to you have to address both when the game starts. We're trying to win ball games before the game starts. We're trying to prepare ourselves individually to get better. And it's you know it's a it's a kaizen process of small increments uh, increments and small uh, steps daily. And because once you get to the big leagues, it doesn't stop. You're there. It's the only job in the world where someone's waiting outside your office door to take your desk and your chair. You know, they're, they're trying, and they have a draft every year to get someone better than you. Yeah, it's a very, very, very competitive environment, and, you, and you've got to continue to raise the bar daily in terms so how, of performance. So, how do you help these guys um, develop their routines? How big of a role do you play? How much input actually comes from you, and how much originates from the athlete? Well, everything you do is a collaborative effort. You know, a sermon from the mountain, you know, if you catch yourself saying, hey, you got to do this and you can't do that, uh, it doesn't work. And like I, when I deal with guys, they say, well, every time I ask you a question, you ask me a question. And I said, yeah, because it's about you. It's not about me. I don't know <laughs> the inner workings of your brain or your body. We got to find out uh, what works best for you. And, and we're trying to... Uh, it, routines we're trying to get routines that that help you perform better and not just eye wash routines and make it look good that your preparation is good and sometimes and we're trying to reduce routines down to the smallest common denominator we don't want we don't want the athlete driven by his routine i was a uh, uh we used to have a a, a, a little uh, get together every year with ken Raviza and he used to bring in the top sports guys guys in the, in the world and he brought a guy in from north carolina uh, who worked at University of North Carolina, worked with a basketball team, but worked with a golf team. And matter of fact, he taught uh, Michael Jordan how to play golf. And, and so he's coaching the golf team and, and the golf coaches, uh, uh, he's a sports psych guy for the golf team and mental skills. And, and they're in the NCAA tournament and this guy gets up to a very important putt and uh, takes his three practice swings, his last practice swing. He scuffs the, the turf and steps up and, Puts the ball, misses the putt, and the next day he says, "He says, why did you do that?" He says, "Your last stroke was bad." He says, "Oh, well, that's what I do. That's my routine." And so again, <laughs> you got to be careful that the routine is not in control of you; that you're in control of your routine. That's great, great, great <laughs> advice. Um, this is a question. One of my coaches is actually um, <clears throat> going to be leaving us to go take an assistant coaching job at a Division One college, and um, I said, "You know." Let me ask Jerry something that you really, really would like to know prior to going into a coaching job. And he said, <clears throat> ask him this. What do you typically see, if anything, immediately prior to a hitter getting into a flow state where they get hot for an extended period of time or game? In other words, do you generally see some behavior that might tell you this guy's getting ready to get on a roll? Well, I, I wish I could say, yeah, now hey, he's getting ready to take off. And uh, I think you, I wish so you, you would know when to leave him. See and define it. But one of the things that you'll see is the quality of his work, especially pregame and things like that. And then also, uh, you know, uh, just his, his body language, how he carries himself. Uh, you know, the I'm looking for that uh, low, high and high, low type guy that's not, that is really more in, invested in his, his process than, than the outcome and, and continues to stay the course and, and with every bad swing or every bad at bat doesn't get lower and every good contact, you know, riding that emotional roller coaster. So I think that uh, I don't think there's one thing that you could, could say, but uh, we had a, a young third baseman in double A was hitting like 130. Everybody was concerned and I went in there and I, and I saw him swing. I said, he's, he's really, to me, just watching his swing and his swing decisions. When I say swing decisions, you know, take balls and swing and strikes. And I said, they were really good. And his pregame was really good. I said, this guy's going to take off. Well, he's, he's just about leading the Eastern League right now uh, after a really bad first month. And so uh, uh, I, I think there are, some, there are some clues, but you, you got to be careful. You know, and some of it becomes wishful thinking <laughs> yeah. and instead of reality. I don't think you can hang your hat on it, but I do I do see guys that are level, that uh, are making good swing decisions and that are having good pregames and that they're not on an emotional roller coaster. Great, great 
answer. Um, that's going to help. That's hopefully going to help my guy a lot. Um, your your online analysis when we when we look at your Twitter feed, um, you point out. I love when you, you you take a play and you point out things. The other day about the rundown, um, I saw you. Uh, you know, guy faking the arm just to just to get the guy to commit. Um, your online analysis of what's happening in specific game situations is outstanding. Um, I believe you often see subtleties in the game that that many may or may not. Um, that's is that once again just time spent on earth? Is that? Well, I you know, I think that's part of my DNA too. I'm a real detailed guy, and I've always been interested in gaining an edge by seeing the game a little bit differently, uh, seeing the game within the game. But also, yeah, I haven't done this for a long time. Uh, but I, but you see something you haven't seen before just about every day when you go to the ballpark if you're looking for it. You know, if, if you're looking for it. Right. You know, it's, it depends on, on, on your lens. And I'm looking for the, the little things that nobody else sees that can make a difference. And when you were younger, um, the scope of that <laughs> lens that you're looking through, um, obviously, you haven't seen as much at that time. I remember early on in the, in the, in the podcast, you said, I've always actually been kind of thinking like that since I was since I was young I, I can say that for myself too but what I do think is your ability to go a little bit more in depth to something um, stems from maybe seeing seeing it a lot and having different reasons why something happened so um, instead of just seeing something for the first two or three four years of your coaching um, kind of always happens for a reason and then all of a sudden over the years there's two and three reasons that this could be happening and I think it makes you look a little deeper into the lens when you're looking at a play like like you're looking at you know going to look for something as far as the guy's foot plant instead of like the, the classic um, you know taking too long of a lead you know what I mean like I think you look in depth a little bit more from what I see from what you talk about well I, do, I definitely do. I, I know the, the ins and outs pretty much of everything that goes on on the field, but also that's a, that can be a double-edged sword. You know, I keep that internal because my focus, <laughs> excuse me, my focus uh, for players is to become more external and less internal. Right. I'm interested in ball flight. I mean, yeah. when the ball leaves your hand, what does it look like? When the ball leaves your bat, what does it look like? And because it's such a reactive sport, and I think that – but being too internal, we can be overly analytical and not be able to react to situations. And right. We have to train ourselves to react to the stimulus and get the, the type of response we want. Uh, and I, th I think that that thought process as a young player probably hurt me because <laughs> I was probably overly analytical, even though I wanted to be this guy who, you know, played in the big leagues or did whatever or was in the NFL or and yet, uh, I, I often, with, with my lens being very analytical, prevented me from being as reactive as I probably should or could have been. Well, I have a concept about that because I feel like when we're young and we're trying to get better, and I see it all the time on social media, um, I, I can see that a lot of these young guys, which is great because that's what you do when you're young, they don't really have a lot of other things in their life that are happening, such as children and worrying about a family. And I think when I tell guys, my guys all the time, hey guys, you know what? Right now you're overthinking a lot of this and I can promise you, when you have a kid, bless you. Thank you. I can promise you, once you have a kid and you have another life to worry about and support, your BS meter goes way up and you, you have to prioritize and you become a lot better at, at, at putting things in their slots quickly because you have to. And I think it, it, it leaks in to what you were just saying. When I was young, I think it hurt me. And I think when we get older, we actually have to start to prioritize a little bit because life starts happening. Well, uh, I think that having uh, more than one cylinder, which I don't, unfortunately, I've got this one cylinder, which is pretty filled up with baseball, but I do, I still read. And I still exercise every day and uh, I still go to the beach and get in the water and, and do those other things. But, you know, the main piece in that cylinder is the baseball piece. And like I'm always talking, like I just left uh, Spokane and, and we have a really high level catcher there, Drew Romo, who's a phenom. And he's, he's, he reminds me of myself as a young player consumed by the sport. And I brought him, I brought him a book to read. 
I brought him a Michael Conley uh, book. Uh, and uh, That's hey, great. Le- learn how to play the guitar. You know, have have a little bit of an outlet. But he does it in a good way. He doesn't. He's in the he's in the windshield and doesn't spend time in the rearview mirror. So he's able to move on. So. <laughs> That's uh, that's great. Um, <clears throat> what do you look for when you're evaluating a player? Uh, you know, if you're helping a young man get recruited or scouted, what advice can you or would you give him? Well, do it for the right reasons. Do it. Number one, play because you really enjoy playing. The, the, you enjoy all, all parts of it. You enjoy the challenges of adversity. You enjoy the, uh, the heights of performance. But you, you, you enjoy the game, and it's something that you want to do because you want to do it, not because uh, your peers are doing it or because uh, your girlfriend likes you to do it or your folks, you know, they get, they get some uh, pleasure of you doing it, even though that they will, and there's nothing wrong with that. But you've got to really have a passion for what you're doing and then, uh, and then, then figure it out for yourself. Figure out what you need to do to be the best version of you and be, be your own best coach. And like I tell all young coaches, I tell them, hey, your job is to eliminate your job. We don't need codependent players. We need players. It's a very solitary thing, baseball. When you're on the mound or you're in the batter's box, it's mano a mano. It's one on one. And, you know, and the guy in the dugout isn't going to help you. And maybe in the preparation state, yes, but really be, accept the responsibility for your actions. I think all too often today, the national pastime is transfer of blame and accepting responsibility, enjoying what you're doing. And then, be really good when things are going bad. Have a good process because as a as a college recruiter or as a pro evaluator, you know, I I have no problem seeing guys that can run, hit and throw, hit for power and field. I that's that's really easy. But what I can't see is what's gonna happen when things go bad, when the so and so hits the fan, how do you handle it? And our our bodies, this is an interesting thing I tell people all the time. Our bodies are so addicted to endorphins and when your body releases endorphins from being excited, it doesn't know what has tr- necessarily transpired. It just knows that you're getting an excited and it creates an addiction to that. So I think that's a big thing. When you, you, know, when you do something really great, you, you want to do that great again. Your body wants to feel those endorphins. But you know what else? When you give up a home run and you're a pitcher – Compose yourself and don't let those endorphins get released because your body is reading those endorphins as well. And I think it gets addicted to the endorphins. And if it's if it starts to get used to a lot of endorphins getting released from something that goes wrong, um, you are you are triggering things that can can that can you know lead you down that path as well as good things. So m- maintaining when things go wrong is huge. Without a doubt, I don't, there's a story about Babe Ruth that he had just struck out for the eighth straight time and comes back to the dugout and it you know, didn't seem to be too bothered by him. Babe, he says, uh, <laughs> you struck out eight straight. Time. Doesn't that bother you? He says, not. Nah. He says, I'm just that much closer to my next home run. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. I think that's just a really, really, um, a key thing, um, that once again, a really truly experienced guy can, can, can help, help a young athlete out with that. Um, Amid all, amid all the negativity on social media, much coming from what seems to be younger athletes and coaches, and I'm not saying that all young athletes and coaches are negative. I just see the, the wars that, that you were just talking about on, on social media between a lot of younger athletes and coaches with less time in the trenches. Um, you, with all your knowledge, are as positive as it gets. You're always teaching. You're always spreading knowledge in a positive way. What advice do you have for young coaches coming up the ranks in regards to helping with their first impressions, other people's impressions of them, as far as posting on social media? Because this has become the way we communicate. Before, we would talk to a guy about how to own the room when he walks in the room. I tell my daughter all the time, you know what, whatever you say, make sure it's clever. Um, if I could, she, if and I, I, and I also tell her, you know what the most important thing you can do in your life? You need to learn to walk into an environment. You need to walk into a room and you need to be able to suss it out and figure out what you need to do to function at optimum performance in this room, whether it be a bathroom or a conference room or wherever it is, a nightclub, whatever it is. And I think that, um, 
if you could help our guys out with that, I think a lot of times guys are blowing their cool on, on social media. And I, I, I don't think they understand that it's just really not helping their situation any. Well, I think the ego is, 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 is a tough thing. You're either humble or about to be humble. And I think that part of combating that issue is self-deprecation. We're, we're, we're just, I, I always start off and say, look, at, let me tell you something. I, I've done a lot of bad coaching in my day. I, I'm basically an idiot. So I'm just giving you what I here, got here. right now based on the fact that I've learned from being an idiot that I could be better by doing this and, and not trying to be the smartest guy in the room, even though sometimes I get that label because I've got a lot of info and I'm not afraid to put it out there. But it's just my opinion. It's not, it's not necessarily fact. And what works for one guy doesn't work for everybody. And I remember early on, I've always been – kind of the mentor type coach in terms of both players and coaches. And I, I wrote articles in my early twenties for a guy named Herman Mason, who was uh, the editor of, uh, of Scholastic Coach, great guy, worked out in New York until his mid to late nineties as an editor. And he really, he really helped me organize my thoughts. And, and early on, you know, when I put stuff out there, it's not like, Hey, this is the gospel. It's not a, sermon from the mound it's not etched in stone it's just these are my thoughts just i'm just trying to stimulate your thinking i early on when i started to do the social media stuff it, i had written the book a book on catching and alan jager the you know alan long time yeah. great guy and and he says hey i read your book it's really good he says where's your website i said i don't have a website he says do you tweet i said jager i don't i don't know what you're talking about he says oh you're a dinosaur this was about probably eight or nine years ago. And he says, I'm going to help you get set up on Twitter. And so I did and just put snippets of the book on there and people would comment. And then they started asking other questions. As I was, and I was getting positive feedback, which for me, being a mentor type guy, uh, you know, just encouraged me to do more and more. And so I try and put, I'm kind of have an addictive type personality. So I put something in there every day that I find that maybe will help and i and i will highlight maybe will help someone in their life or their program get better and so uh and again that's what we're about it's not about us it's about um you know making someone else better helping someone else achieve their goals i think i think that's awesome awesome advice because i every time every time i listen to you speak or i watch you or i'm i'm ha i'm hanging out with you at a at a seminar i i always walk away from you and i always think god damn what what a nice effing guy i'm like i'm always i always feel really good around you and i think when you make people feel like that you 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 just you just bring that energy to you you know i have a i have an athlete in here one time and he said you know what i don't even know if what you're telling me is is actually right he said just the passion and how you make me feel and when you're delivering it i have no option but to believe you <laughs> he's like i think and i think i think that you're just so passionate about what you do i think it's part of what makes it really great to listen to you speak because you just deliver it in a way and i think these young guys need to um they it's the delivery is what I'm talking about. You know, it's the way it is. You don't have to bash somebody to get your point across. Well, you're speaking from an audience in a, at a seminar. If you were in the other dugout for 25 years at Sacramento <laughs> City College and I'm trying to do tap dance on your trachea for nine <laughs> innings, you wouldn't have the same, you wouldn't have the same thing. <laughs> um, finally, let's... Uh, Finally, give me two of your biggest aha moments that you feel played a major role in guiding your path through such a successful career. If you had to sit back and think, and knowing you, you have them right at the top of your head. Well, actually, I don't. But uh, oh, okay. the, one of them, I, I have one for sure. Uh, in uh, 1983, uh, when I went to the University of Miami for a year, that was huge. It really, it really elevated my expectations. And I just went for a year because I told my wife, we'll take a year's leave of absence and we'll go there. And, and if it doesn't work out, then, uh, then we'll come back. And fortunately, <laughs> we were struggling at the end, but got, got to a regional and won and got to the College World Series. So I felt like I could, uh, I could leave in good conscience and go back to Sac City. But I brought a lot of 
things from Ron Frazier and the program at University of Miami that helped our program at Sacramento City College greatly. And I think that that was, was, was certainly a, an aha moment. Um, I, I, and probably the, the seminal aha moment, just that, that experience down there for that year. Uh, uh, I guess uh, the other thing is uh, when I first started coaching and, you know, and I, and I, I found a, we were winning ball games, but guys were getting better and having success and getting scholarships or signing. And, and we had 34 big league players at Sacramento city college, not because of me, but be, we had, you know, perfect storm with a community that supported baseball and great facilities and great assistant coaches. And we got good players. And so, you know, the ability to associate uh, intelligent, hard work and good recruiting with uh, performance on the field, you know, those two mesh pretty good. At that that's time. that Sparky. That's that Sparky Anderson thing. Just get that's surround right. yourself with great people. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that, I think that, um, I think that the, to, the summary of, summary of what we've been talking about here a lot of that revolves around um you know reading as much like what i'm grabbing from what i heard from you you know reading as much as you can learning as much as you can and staying on top of things and surrounding yourself with great people and losing your vanity being able to be a little bit more humble i think these are things that help help, help can help our young guys grow a lot um it's things that i think that are really um are lacking and I, I think that you bring a lot to the table I was really looking forward when you said you were going to do this podcast I was really looking forward to, to speaking with you because we cross each other's paths all the time um, you know when we're speaking but we never really get to sit down and talk and I was I was always like wow this is this is one guy I'd really like to talk to and let tell tell uh, tell everybody out there how your, your, your how they can reach you um well, just uh, on Twitter, it's JW, capital JW, on lowercase, on catching, C, uh, capital, all caps. And I get random calls all the time, you know, and I may shut them down fast, but, uh, and then JWBBSLO1 at gmail.com. And I like to, you know, I like to be part of the process if it helps you get better and if I can offer a suggestion. But again, it's just a suggestion and, and, I'm wrong much of the time, but, uh, you know, I'm, I, I like to help people be successful. Awesome, Jerry. I want to really thank you for coming by. Our guest <laughs> is Jerry Weinstein. Uh, you can reach me at my Twitter page at Nunzio Signore or at my facility at RPP underscore baseball website, www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. Um, I have a book out called Velocity-Based Training, How to Apply Science and Technology and Data to Maximize Performance. You can get that. It's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's released by Human Kinetics, and you can also get it on Amazon. This was, a, this was a joy for me. Stay tuned for the next Behind the Seams podcast, and thanks for tuning in.